are you, uh, Jordan? Oh, and I'm still here, still fighting and uh, going to court and all that kind of stuff, trying to get everything I own given back to me by the court, and it is not happening. <laughs> mm. Court, the the courts don't seem to care one way or the other because I'm not important enough. Yeah. So anyway, I just keep fighting, see where it goes. But outside of that, uh, I'm still here. I moved out of Los Angeles, so I'm not in California anymore. Oh no. But I am, yeah. But I am in um, Pacific, still in Pacific time zone. I'm that close. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what else is happening? Jordan Maxwell, welcome back for the fifth part of the interview. Well, thank you very much. I didn't realize it was five shows we've done, the five shows we're doing. Boy, that, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, just to, to remind you that this is a, a seven-part uh, interview, just to be sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine with me. Uh, Jordan Maxwell, your field of expertise is symbolism. What mm -hmm. key symbols around us are important to know? And what are they trying to tell us exactly? Well, there are many, obviously, many, many hundreds of symbols that the occult world uses, that mysticism uses, that religion uses. I mean, the Jews uh, use the menorah. Uh, you know, Christians use the cross. Uh, all kinds of symbolisms that are used in religions, and of course, in politics and in government as all. Well. So, you know, corporations use symbols everybody's using symbols and emblems but for me i deal in secret societies and fraternal orders and secret uh, secret uh, uh, arrangements between nations that people the people of of the of the world do not know exist and so i'm very interested in organized crime criminal syndicates and the symbols they use, uh, you know, the secret societies, criminal societies out of Europe and Asia and, uh, and around the world. There are major, major uh, international criminal operations going on, criminal societies which are raping the peoples of the world, lying to them, manipulating them, exploiting their ignorance, etc., but the most important symbol I feel after looking at this subject for over 60 years, uh, I started, as I've told you before, I started looking at symbols and, and began to develop uh, something that is referred to today as pattern recognition. I began at a very early age for some reason, I don't know why, I just began at a very early age seeing uh, patterns in things what people would say, people would do, uh, in advertisements and what the President of the United States would say, uh, which is the same thing that somebody in big industry would say the same words, the same terms. And so, you know, some 60 years ago, I became interested in pattern recognition. And, and, you know, of course, now, after 60 years of looking at this, uh, it's everywhere for me. I see patterns everywhere uh, where banks are all using the same terms, uh, governments use the same terms that the banks use. Uh, then, then when you see the same identical words and terms and symbols, used by government and banks and insurance companies are the same symbols and words and terms used by churches and religion, uh, you know, and then seeing that around the world, all the connections behind the scenes. It finally dawned on me about 40 years ago that the whole world is filled with symbols and emblems, and it's not by chance. It's not by chance that uh, that governments operate behind the scenes with insurance companies 
and insurance companies are the bosses of all banks. People in the world have no idea in the world that the insurance companies are the real uh, movers and shakers in the banking world. And so uh, banks, insurance companies, religions, governments, uh, secret societies, that's the whole world of business. It's all a business. And the people at the top know how this thing works. They know all the dark secrets of the words and terms that people use around the world, you know, the different presidents of different countries, they know what they're talking about, and other presidents and other governments are listening. And so we hear it on the street, we hear what the president's saying, but we don't understand that there's a whole conversation going on uh, among the elites right in front of us, and we don't even know what they're talking about. And we know that happens even today in families. You know, you know, young children, young teenagers can be on the phone talking with other teenagers right in front of their mom and dad, right in front of their parents. And they're talking about selling drugs or, or, or other criminal, criminal things that they're doing or going to do. And the parents have no idea in the world what their kids are talking about because they're using, you know, the language of kids. They're using their their lingo, and but they know what they're talking about. You don't. And so uh, you can listen to your daughter or your son on on the telephone, and you think it's just a bunch of chatter by a bunch of teenagers. No, no, no. They're talking about something you don't know. They've got terms and words that you don't understand. And so that's the way government is. That's the way insurance companies are and police departments and, and religions and all the other institutions that men have made, all the other institutions that people over the thousands of years have built up so that today there's a world of communication going on behind the scenes. And so that's what I've been looking at for some 60 years and and I you know there's just an awful lot of important symbolism going on but the single most important symbol of all in my opinion is a political religious and political symbol which is in my opinion the most important symbol the world has ever known but you don't understand until I show it to you until you actually see it, how it's being used by government, it's being used by religions and churches, it's being used by institutions of education, the police department, sheriff's department, government agencies, uh, private uh, in investment companies, all over the world, this one symbol is being used. Uh, by all kinds of, of, uh, of institutions and, and uh, government religious operations, but the people uh, don't see it. It's so well hidden, and yet once you know about it, <laughs> I have people all over the world emailing me and calling me and telling me, Jordan, I see that symbol now everywhere, where before I never saw it at all until you told us about it. Now I see it in movies, in television, in commercials, in the police department, in government, in religion, in churches, in synagogues. I see that one symbol everywhere. And most people, uh, once you see it, and once you are, are aware of how pervasive it is everywhere, you still don't know what it means. And so the next step is to explain what it's talking about, what it means. So the symbol I'm talking about, and you will look for it everywhere, is a sunrise between two mountains. When you see a sun rising between two mountains, that is a very powerful occult sign and symbol, which, is, which goes back to the ancient very, very ancient uh, Egyptian religion, which incidentally was based on Hindu. So it goes back to an ancient Hindu, later an Egyptian religion, based on Akhenaten, or the sun god. And so in ancient Egypt, there was a symbol of the sun, 
uh, with the spokes, you know, the sunrise with the spokes of the, of the rays, rising up behind two mountains. And it was all over Egypt, all over India and Africa and all over the Middle East. And then, of course, with the coming of the, of the, uh, of the Grecian Empire, the Greeks picked it up and were using it everywhere. Then the Romans picked it up, and the Roman Empire picked up that symbol of the sun rising between two mountains. And today, of course, it's all over the earth. You can't even find one little city in the middle of nowhere that doesn't have that symbol on the city hall or the county office or the sheriff's department or something. Everybody uses it. But nobody seems to understand what it really actually means. And so, again, the symbol is the sun rising between two mountains. And the sunrise period, sunrise period is a very important part of it, but usually it's accompanied by two mountains. And so that goes back to, as I said, the, uh, an ancient Egyptian symbol, which, uh, which now gets into the most powerful secret societies in this world the illuminated societies that came out of ancient Egypt with their priesthoods. And today we have huge religious movements around the world that have priesthoods. And all the religions and all the governments all use and all commerce and business use the mountains, uh, the two mountains with the sunrise in between them. Now I have uh, a, a two new videos I have two new videos just came out within about a week ago. I released them that you can purchase now on my website, which is Jordan Maxwell Show. Jordan Maxwell Show is my website. There are other websites bearing my name, but they're not mine right now. I'm fighting in court to get them back, but they're not mine. But my website is jordanmaxwellshow.com. And when you go there, you will see on the right-hand side of the page a little, a little banner that says Jordan Maxwell Videos. Click on that little banner, Videos, and you will see the two new videos I have. And one of them is called Cosmocrats. And in that video, it's over an hour long, in that video, Cosmocrats, the word Cosmocrats, Crats simply means rulers, like Democrats and Plutocrats, well, Crats means leaders, but, but uh, Cosmos means the world, like Cosmocrats, and uh, I mean Cosmonauts, those who circle the world, so they're called Cosmonauts. Well, Cosmos is the world, Crats are rulers, therefore my, my new video is called Cosmocrats are rulers of this world. And I talk about that particular symbol, which is the single most important symbol of this world, period. And then I show how it is used from the ancient prehistoric world to India, to Africa, to Asia, to Egypt, then into the Grecian and Roman Empire, and how it is used today everywhere in the world, and especially in America and North America, and it's, it's everywhere. But the point being is that this video is showing you not only how many places that same identical symbol are used, but what it actually means. I go back to the reference works in ancient Egypt and show you what that symbol represents. And basically uh, boils down to this. That symbol represents a totalitarian fascist world rule where there's going to be a government that will control the entire world of mankind and it is based on the ancient sun god of ancient Egypt. Again, like I said, ancient Egypt got that whole idea of a sun god from Hindus, from India, but it was perfected in Egypt. And so today, that symbol symbolizes a secret society which is dominating the whole entire world. And that secret society symbol is, as I said, a sunrise between two mountains. And I can talk about this for hours on end, but you've got to see the video. You've got to see how it's used. 
and how pervasive its use is and then see what it actually means when we go to the reference works and encyclopedias and dictionaries, etc., and boil down what does that symbol mean. So you will see it everywhere, and no matter what country you're in, look at your government symbols, your police symbols, colleges, universities, um, uh, private organizations. I don't care what it is. Look for that symbol, um, uh, a sunrise between two mountains. It's everywhere. So what it basically means is a symbol of a secret society that's come out of ancient Egypt. And uh, it's, it's the worship of the sun. It's sun worship. But it's also the symbol for a very powerful secret society that now is trying desperately to control and dominate the entire world. All peoples, races, creeds, and colors will live under this secret society that is been working for hundreds of years to dominate the world. Well, they finally got their symbol to dominate the world, but now it's up to, you know, now the last part is to get us humans to agree to uh, to live under that symbol. And so I'm saying that unless you know about that symbol and unless you understand what it means and why it's on the police department and sheriffs and government and churches and banks and every place else, unless you understand what it means, then you will understand uh, how pervasive it is, how big of a problem this really is. We are facing, we human beings are facing an enemy which is so huge, so large, so well-funded, so politically strong, that unless you understand how big this enemy is, uh, you're never going to see how much trouble we are really in as human beings. I don't care what government you live under. I just don't care what you, your personal beliefs are or your political persuasion. doesn't matter. No matter who you are, you are being dominated by a far, far more powerful secret uh, order and it's, uh, it's basically what I call, and it's been used, that, that organization has been called in the past, and I use it because I think that the term is correct, the organization which seeks to dominate the world that uses this symbol is referred to as the World Revolutionary Movement, w -R -M, World Revolutionary Movement. The World Revolutionary Movement is combined with the Communist Party, with the Nazi Party, with the entire religious establishment throughout the world, from, from Zionism to Catholicism to Judaism to uh, Islamic religion. All of these organizations and religions are under the domination of something called the World Revolutionary Movement. And so I see this as a war between a very powerful, intelligent, well-financed, extremely brilliant um, master plan to control the world on one side, and we human beings out there, you know, trying to stay alive and living from one day to the next, we are, are, are confronting that and don't even know it. We don't know who the enemy is. We don't know what his symbols mean. We don't know who they are. And so we humans on the earth are all in the same boat. We're all in trouble because we don't understand how big this world movement is really how, all about, how big it is and how what it's all about. It's frightening when you begin to see. And again, if you want the real details that you can sit and watch and understand, I have a video. That, uh, that's on my new website that you can order the video. And both of them, there are two videos, and that's basically part one and part two. You really need to get both to understand, and all the information is there. When you go on my website, you'll see Jordan Maxwell, um, jordanmaxwellvideos.com. Click on it and read about the two videos. It's got all the information, what it's about, uh, what it's talking about, what the symbols are, and then you can order it if you want. So... That's the most important symbol, in my opinion. Gene, what, what is the, the purpose 
to put in our face the, the, these symbols that reveals uh, their their plans to conquer the world. Uh, look at being Canadian. Every time you see the maple leaf or the flag with the maple leaf or the Canadian uh, uh, symbol from Canada, you just naturally, as a Canadian, like anybody else in any other country, you naturally assume it's government. And if it's government, it represents the national government of the country you live in, then you're not going to question it. It's you know, nothing for you to question. This is the federal government of the country. And this is the symbol that represents it. Well, if you don't like it, then say something. But this is the symbol that the government uses. So what I'm saying is that the people of this world are slowly but surely being propagandized into accepting that symbol. And as I said, the police departments use it, colleges and universities use it, the sheriff uses it, banks use it, uh, uh, you know, uh, Police and military uses it everywhere in the world. People are using that symbol and not realizing that that is a symbol for a very powerful secret society. And so, you know, eventually that's going to become so perverse. It, it is now. It's, it prevails everywhere. But people just accept it without knowing what it means, without accepting, without doing any research on who came up with that symbol, what does it mean, where did it come from, and why is everybody on the earth using it? So I'm saying that it is used as a propaganda tool so that people see it all the time and don't even question it. And just like Americans, we see the American flag or, or the symbol for the, you know, the coats of arms of the United States, uh, which is on the back of the dollar bill, the eagle with the with that symbolism. We just assume that's government. That's our country. That's our government. We don't realize, no, 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 there's something going on here. The eagle goes back to the Roman Empire and it can be traced all the way back to the Sumerians. That's a very ancient symbol uh, America uses, the eagle. You look at it, you will find all the ancient uh, governments of the world have used the eagle. The eagle represents something. And then to have the arrows in one hand and the, and the, uh, and the stripes and the stars above its head, all of these symbols are taken from things thousands of years ago that you don't even know anything about. And so when Americans look at that symbol on the dollar bill, which is their, you know, the national seal for the United States of America, you say, wait a minute. That's not, we didn't just dream that up and put that as a symbol. No, no, that symbol's been around, and those parts of those symbols have been around for thousands and thousands of years. And so you need to go back and start doing some real dark homework on where did our governments really come from? And where do those symbols actually come from? And then start breaking down, you know, uh, where these things have originated and what they mean and what do they mean about you? What are they telling you about you in the country? And what part, uh, you know, you just, uh, you, you have no idea in the world what, what you are doing in the country. The country owns you. You know, you have to abide by laws and regulations stipulations and, and permits and all of that. Why? Because there's something else going on. And that's why there are different countries and different countries have different symbols. So I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's a real education to wake up, to look at the symbols on your money, look at the symbols on your, on your uh, mail, on your stamps, look at the symbolism that's used by corporations, by police departments, by religions and churches, and especially, that's my feel, is religion and churches and synagogues are using symbols that you would not believe what they really mean. So this is what I've been trying to tell people for you know some 60 years now. Look at these symbols. Go to an encyclopedia and look up and see what these things mean, what these symbols on your money actually mean who is actually, in fact, printing your money, uh, how, uh, who decides how much your money is worth, 
who is actually, in point of fact, running your government. Because it's obviously not the people. The people just do whatever the government tells them to do, and that's it. Well, the, the government's made up of people. Well, who, who are the people who are deciding how you will live? Who are these people? Now, nobody knows their names. Nobody knows where they are. It's just somebody is writing books. They're called law books. And so the lawyers, and, and if you're going to be a lawyer, you have to go to college and read the law books and study law books. And so the lawyers go to college and they study the law books so they can come out and get a, and get a work permit. Now they can go to work and, and make money being a lawyer. But it never occurs to anybody to ask, wait a minute, why do lawyers have to have a license? Why is it that if you're going to be a, a minister in a church, you have to have a license? You've got to be licensed by the government to be a minister in a church. When you're talking about God and you're talking about spiritual things, you can talk all you want if you've got a license. If you don't have a license, you're in trouble. And so you can go to jail for that, talking about God. Nobody told you you have the license to do that. Well, you can go to jail, too, for, for talking about law in a court. If you're not a lawyer, you have no right to say anything. And so, uh, and so we know that lawyers have to have a license. Everybody's got to have a license to do something. You can't even get married without a license. <laughs> So you have a license because the government is telling you it's okay for you if you get a license. If Caesar says it's okay for you to talk about God, well, that's fine. Now you can talk because you have a license. But if you don't have a license, you can go to jail. So you better keep your mouth shut. Why do lawyers have licenses? It's because they're using law books. Lawyers use law books. That's how they do make a living. They study the law, and then they go in and represent you to the law. But who wrote those law books? Who were the authors of the law books that your lawyers use? Because whoever wrote those law books uh, has the uh, copyright on them. And therefore, if the lawyer is going to use that law book to make money in court, that book is copyrighted, and he cannot use that copyrighted material unless he pays a fine or a fee once a year. He's got to be licensed to use that. Well, the same thing in Hollywood. If you write a play or a movie script and the, and the studios like it and they want to make a movie about it, they can't just go out and make a movie on it because you wrote a script. They got to come to you and your lawyer and got to pay you. Uh, and you, they need to get a license from you, hand signed by you and your attorney, that it's all right for them to use, and that and they will pay you for that license to use your name and your work and your your story to make a movie out of. Why? Because you own it. They don't own it, but they're going to make a movie out of it, and make a lot of money. So they have to pay you up front and get your permission. The same thing with a lawyer. The lawyer is going to use a law book to make money, but he better pay the license fee and, and better be uh, licensed by the court to use that law book. And therefore, he has to pay a license every year. So, you know, that's the same thing if you get married. You've got to get a license. Why? Because you, you can't just go out and get married anytime you want. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Marriage is considered an international in language, marriage is considered a business. It's a business, and that's why you have to have a license. And when I see you with some woman one night, and I tell you the next day, you know, that girl you were out with last night, she's bad company. Bad company? And you say, mind your own business. Business? Company? And then I find out you're going to get married, and she's going to be your partner. What are you talking about? Business, company, partner? You're talking commerce. It's a business. And if you don't think it's a business, if your business don't work out, you're not going to God, you're going to court and bring your money and your house and your car because it's just a piece of business. So all I'm saying is you need to learn how the world really works. I mean, I could talk all night about this stuff, but it's very simple. 
You live in a world of commerce and business. Money makes the world go round. So that's the way life is. I don't care if you're talking about God or marriage. It don't matter. It's a business. So that's it. Jordan Maxwell, have you ever go in the Vatican? Yes, I, I, I took a... Uh, I took a tour which very few people ever get to take. I took a very special tour through the Vatican. I went in the back way. I didn't go in the front way like all the other tourists. I went around to the very back of the Vatican and went in the back way. And I was given a special tour of the Vatican. Uh, they wheeled me around in a wheelchair. And because I, at my age, I couldn't walk that, that distance, so they wheeled me around in a wheelchair, and I and I had a I had a really incredible, a well, uh, you know, well put together Vatican tour, and in which they rolled me around all the back rooms, all the storage rooms. I didn't get into the uh, the library. Now, I doubt anybody could get into that thing. But I did have a really special tour. Uh, the young man who set it up for me did an incredible job and got me to go through the Vatican. I saw it all. You know, it's a fascinating place, boy, once you see what it really is and who's really running it. Because in the Vatican, uh, I never go there myself uh, physically. Uh, but There is a lot of strange pieces of heart, uh, pagan heart, that have nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, do, do, uh, have you seen something very w wrong with all these uh, pieces of art? Yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> It's very wrong if you just know what you're looking at. Something that has always amazed me and bothered me Uh, it's it's extraordinarily important, but nobody seems to know about it. When you're talking about the Vatican, then you're talking about the Catholic Church. I'm not talking about the Catholic people. I'm not talking about my mother was a Catholic. Uh, my my family were Catholics. I'm not condemning the people. I'm talking about the corporation, the company, the 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 Vatican itself as a corporation as an institution. I'm not talking about the people. But what has always bothered me is that something so obvious, so really in your face obvious, nobody sees it. And that is that the Pope is wearing what he's called a miter. The Pope's miter is that strange looking hat the Pope's wear. Catholics all over the world see the Pope wearing that strange hat that we call the Pope's mitre and have no idea in the world why the Pope wears that particular strange hat. And the, the cardinals on occasion will wear the same kind of hat, that strange pointed hat that the Pope wears. And people all over the world who are Catholic, who are very sincere Christian Catholics have no concept, no understanding at all what that headdress, that, 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 that mitre that the Pope wears, what it means. And that's what's so extraordinary to me. When you find out what that hat represents, then it's, uh, it, I don't even know, I don't have it, words in English to explain how uh, atrocious this whole subject is when you find out what that Pope's mitre represents. The Pope is wearing that strange hat that he wears, very large pointed hat. It's called a mitre, M-I-T-E-R, the Pope's mitre. It represents the God of the Catholic Church. It represents the divine presence of God uh, over the Pope. The Pope is beneath the, the, the mitre. The mitre represents the God of the Catholic religion. And that God, all you have to do is go to an encyclopedia and look it up, go to a, a reference work, or go on the web and just type in 
the word for the God of the Catholic Church. Now, many people think the Catholic Church is worshiping Jesus. But in point of fact, no, that's not true. That's what you think it's doing. But that, that Pope's mitre does not represent Jesus. It represents the God of the Catholic Church, and that God's term, the name of that God is Dagon. D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. And to all Catholics and anybody interested, go to a library, go on the web, go to a, a, a reference work, get a book on religious symbols and look up the word. You can do it on the web very easily. Look up Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. Uh, Dagon is the god of the Catholic Church. It was a fish god. It was a fish god that came out of the sea. And the ancient Phoenicians and Canaanites called him Anus, or uh, Onis, Onis, O-N, O-N-E, Onis, uh, O-N, Onis. But, uh, but the Romans called him Dagon. Dagon and Onis is the same god. A god that came out of the ocean. It was a fish god. And it goes back to the ancient Phoenicians and Canaanites and Philistines were worshiping a pagan god from the ocean called Dagon. And it was a pagan god from the old ancient Phoenician Canaanites. Uh, today, that Dagon worship is called the Roman Catholic Church. And it has nothing to do, do with any man called Jesus or any belief system called Christianity. It's the old Roman religion worship of Dagon because in the ancient Roman Empire before Christianity, the ancient Romans, like the ancient Greeks and all the Babylonians and Sumerians and all the other ancient cultures in the ancient Middle East, all of those ancient cultures worship Dagon. And so today, it is still the worship of Dagon in the Roman Catholic Church. And that's why I am amazed how many people go to church or see the Pope and they're out there crying and, and shouting and jumping around for joy. When they see the Pope come through, everyone is, is, uh, is like they're seeing Santa Claus or Elvis Presley. Everybody's, everybody's jumping around and, they're so, and it's such a holy occasion seeing the Holy Father and never realize for a moment the Pope represents Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, Dagon, the fish god of the Phoenicians and the ancient Phoenician culture. Uh, the Philistines worship Dagon. The ancient peoples called him Anis or Dagon. Go in the dictionary and look it up and you will see three to five thousand years ago, in the reference books, in the encyclopedias, look up Dagon, and you will see that, say, 5,000 years ago, the priests of Dagon were wearing the same identical hat that the Pope wears today, the same identical headdress, the same identical uh, clothing. The words are identical. So, Catholicism has zero, nothing to do whatsoever with Christianity. It's merely a cover. It's merely a cover for the ancient Roman religion, and that's why today the word Catholic is a Latin word, Catholic, which simply means universal. Anything which is universal and all over the world at the same time is referred to in Latin as Catholic. Catholic is not the name of a religion. It's a word which means universal. So therefore, air is Catholic because air is everywhere. Water is Catholic because it's, water is everywhere. Uh, human beings, man and woman, are Catholic because their man and woman is all over the earth. Stupidity is called Catholic because stupidity is all over the world. So the point I'm making is that Catholic simply means universal all over the world. And that's why 1,000, 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire ruled all of the Mediterranean. It ruled the, most of Europe, 
Britannia, and today it rules <clears throat> America and Canada with an iron fist. So that's why we call the worship of Dagon the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic means universal, and Rome is universal. It's all over the world. So the Roman Catholic religion is not Christian. It's the worship of the ancient Roman god Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. Go get the reference books and read for yourself. Jordan Maxwell. Recently, Hollywood have um, adapted from a novel of Dan Brown, Inferno, with uh, Tom Hanks. What do you yep. think about Dan Brown? Because in his books, he plays, he plays with symbols and conspiracies. Yes, well, my opinion... Just my opinion. You're asking for my considered opinion. I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything, but you ask me, I'll tell you what I think. I think Dan Brown is a plagiarist. I don't think Dan Brown wrote anything. I think he's a liar and, a pred and, and has stolen uh, the whole story from the original people who did the original story that he got it from. And, and the way he got it from these, the original authors, there were three British authors in England who wrote the original story many, many years ago. And Dan Brown has some bodies, some bodies or some secret society is, is promoting Dan Brown. Uh, I, you know, there's no doubt in my mind. I've been looking at this kind of stuff for 60 years. I know what I'm talking about. Somebody has put Dan Brown, uh, the story out and put his name on it so he could be the author, but he's not the author. The, the author of that whole story, uh, that the Tom Hanks was in that author, those authors were three British authors back in the BBC in England many years ago. They wrote a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Get the book. It's everywhere. You can order it today. Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And the three authors are Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln, three authors who worked for the BBC in England. And they wrote a television show, a documentary on the Holy Blood, Holy Grail. In other, in other words, Jesus' blood was holy. And the cup of the Christ, when he gave the cup to, to, to drink from, was called the, uh, the cup of the grail. And so they were saying that the holy cup is connected to the holy blood of holy Jesus. Jesus is holy, and the blood and the cup were holy because of that. So the, the cup and the blood are called the holy blood, holy grail. So when you read that, it's the same identical story that Dan Brown talks about in his movie, which tells me Dan Brown didn't write anything. Dan Brown stole that story from Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln. And they went to court many years ago. Most people don't know that. Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln went to court to, to establish. They wrote that research. They put, wrote that story. And Dan Brown won in court. Why? Because he was being financed, organized, directed, and protected by a very powerful, dark, secret society. So that's why when I see Dan Brown, I think of him as nothing more than a front for a very powerful, dark, secret society operating in Europe that we don't know anything about. And they are the ones who gave him the money and promoted him and made sure that he looks like the big, great author that of the of the movie, uh, uh, the Dan Brown. When in point of fact, in fact, I don't believe Dan Brown wrote anything. I think Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln were right when they sued because he stole the story from them. There's nothing of any legitimate value in Dan Brown or his story. It's nothing more than plagiarism in your face. So go back and get the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail by the three authors, Bajan, Lee, and Lincoln. Back in 1980 or 81, they wrote the story that Dan Brown makes into a movie. 
Dan Brown should be sued and chased out of town for plagiarizing and stealing other people's work. That's what I think of him. I don't have any uh, respect for him whatsoever, and I don't have any respect for the secret societies and the bankers who financed him and financed the books so that he could put the book out which lends a credence now to the secret societies and what they're doing. They wanted that story out to promote themselves. I know what's going on. I've been looking at this subject for many years. So when it comes to Dan Brown and his book, I don't have any respect for him whatsoever. None. I think he's a liar and a, and a, and a, and a pledgerer. And the people who financed him and organized him and made the movie about him are equally as corrupt as he is. That's my feeling about Dan Brown. I don't like him and I don't like anything he stands for. I prefer being honest and go back to the people who really wrote the book back in 1980, probably before Dan Brown was in high school. The real masters of this subject are Bajent Lee and Lincoln. Go back and get all of their books. They had about seven books on this one subject. The very first one was Holy Blood, Holy Grail, but there's about six more fascinating books where they document all kinds of things about Jesus and the, and the ancient Masonic orders and, uh, and the Vatican and all the dark stuff going on in the Vatican. That's a whole story. So that's what I think about Dan Brown. Not much. Once more, thank you for your presence to the show. And... We will see you very soon for, I hope, the, six, the sixth part of the interview. Yes, thank you. for Thank you, Peter and uh, Pierre, and, and I appreciate being on the show with you. There's so much more to talk about. But go to my website, Jordan Maxwell Show, and join my research society. It's a whole different website I've got on my original website, Jordan Maxwell Show. I've got a second website called Research Society, in which I'm uploading all of my research over the years, all the dark stuff that people don't know that have never been told. It's a whole website. You can join it, and it's on my website. Uh, it's called Research Society, and uh, you'll find a lot of stuff on there you've never heard before. And again, thank you for having me on. John Maxwell, it's always a great pleasure to, to listen to you. And, uh, oh, I forgot to, to tell you a good year, 2017. Uh, oh, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, I hope United States with Donald Trump uh, <laughs> yeah, will not yeah. go so bad. So. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, I think I think it's a it's a welcome change. Yeah. One other thing I noticed that maybe nobody else has noticed is that uh, the western part of the United States, from the Midwest all the way to the Pacific coast, all one half of America was dying, quite literally dying in a drought for ten years. There was no rain, no snow. Uh, and, and the mountains. So can you imagine a uh, hundred million people, a hundred million people with no water, no rain, which means there's no food, you can't grow crops, you can't take a shower, you have no water to drink, and you've got millions of people with no water? That was frightening. Uh, the implications that I was really very frightened about this because I know, you know, people take it for granted to go take a shower and and uh, and drink water and fix your food with water and cook with water and all the things we use water. Well, but there is no water. There's no snow on the mountains. There's no rivers. Everything is dried up. And two weeks after uh, Trump was finally elected for sure, all of a sudden, the whole of the western United States is now flooding with snow everywhere. All the reservoirs are full of water. It's raining everywhere. And I say, thank God, if there's a God in heaven, thank God that uh, 100 million people have been blessed by the universe with water. 
because without water, humans cannot live. And so after uh, Trump was officially made president, the water came. Now we have plenty of water, we have snow in the mountains, and there's more coming, and so there's plenty of water. I don't know what you think about that, but I thought that was very interesting. One never knows why things happen, but I do know that, there's, uh, there, that there is a dynamics in the universe that, you know, God is, is in the picture somehow. I don't know what God is, but I know it's not on TV. <laughs> But I do believe that there is a higher force in the universe, some kind of a strange, dark power in the universe that watches everything and causes things to happen. So I just thought that's interesting. Uh, uh, I don't say that I hate Donald Trump. I don't know the man, and uh, uh, I gave him the chance to govern uh, the the. United States but there is a lots of propaganda and lies from journalists my god's sake yes yes that's yes, right yes. mm -hmm. so yeah yes and the reason why is because America let me explain to you very quickly why all of this is happening the way it is very simple if you know uh, America has for the past uh, I would say at least the past 70 years that you know because I can only talk about 76 years that's how long I've been here but uh, America has for the past 70 years that I know of been uh, a Marxist Leninist country we are run by and, and our educational institutions and our professors and and schools and colleges and police departments all of our agencies of government have been run by Marxist Leninists Soviet communists so America has become a very Soviet, communist, Marxist, Leninist, totalitarian, fascist police state all over the world. There's nothing free, you know, America, the land of the free and home of the brave. No, there's nothing free or brave about America. We are a fascist police state. And, uh, and that fascist police state is based on Soviet old school, Soviet Marxist communism. And so our country has become, uh, you know, born and raised under Soviet Marxist communism for the past 60 to 70 years. So what, what, uh, what uh, Trump is doing is he's getting rid of the old Soviet communist Marxist Leninist bullshit that has been destroying people around the world, bloodletting, violence criminality in Washington, D.C., and is trying, very desperately, trying to clean up America, clean up its government, and clean up what's been going on for the past 70 years. And he's up against a huge battle because the enemies of America are well entrenched. They got the money, they got the, they got the television stations, the radio stations, and they are Marxist-Leninist thinking. This is the philosophy of the, of the media. Uh, they are thinking and operating as Marxist, Leninist, communist, and so he's trying to take away from the communist world, the Soviet communist world, and give America back to the American people, and give freedom and liberty and justice back to the American people. So obviously, all of the Marxist, Leninist, well-taught kids in school for the past 70 years, they don't know that. They have no idea in the world what he's trying to do. And so that's the bottom line. He's trying to return America back to the Americans. Yeah. Go back to what America was supposed to be, a land of the free, home of the brave, with liberty and justice and honor and decency, instead of the Marxist, Leninist, drug-running, alcoholism, wars and crap and fighting and bloodshed all over the world. That's what America really is, and he's trying to change that. So I'm not, I don't vote for anybody. I'm amoral. I'm a, I, am, I am apolitical. I don't care about politics, but I know what's going on. He's trying to reestablish America in a country that is, is crawling with Marxist, Leninist, Soviet, communist, fascist, Nazis, all kinds of subversive organizations, international bankers who are paying for people to die. So he's up against a horrible organized crime which is dominating the world. So that's what's really happening. That's why people don't like him. He's trying to reestablish the United States of America 
the way it was supposed to be a long time ago. So that's why people hate him, because no more handouts, no more all this Marxist, Leninist, communist bull crap that uh, we've been living with under the Marxist, Leninist government for the past 70 years, killing presidents, promoting alcoholism, drug addiction, violence, wars all over the world. America has become a very, very dark and evil place. And he's trying to clean up this dark, evil, satanic stuff that's been going on in America for 70 years or more. So I see what's going on. I didn't vote for anybody, but I see what's going on. I've been around for 75, 76 years now. I know what's happening, and I know who's doing it. So... That's why people are against Trump, because he's trying to reestablish the American society the way it used to be. And there's too many people in this country who don't want America to be free, and they want America to be in prisons. They want America on drugs so they can drug and rape this country. So that's why there's so much drugs and alcoholism going on in America, because there are people who want America drugged and drunk on alcohol and entertain with ball games and basketball and football and all the ball games so that they don't know. The Americans will have never ever suspect how they're being overthrown and their country is being destroyed. Europe has got the same problem today. So I know what's going on. I know who these people are. And keep in mind all all communist countries, keeping this in mind, all communist countries are called democratic countries. The People's Democratic uh, uh, Republic of China, the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea, the People's Democratic Republic of Cuba, all communist countries are called democratic. Keep that in mind. Democrat means communism. Marxist, Leninist, Soviet communism, we call today Democrat. So today, all over America, we have Democrats who are nothing more than useful idiots and people who are following the Marxist-Leninist philosophy of the old Soviet Union and don't even know it because they're too ignorant and too ill-informed and too full of beer watching their ball games to understand what the real tune is really all about. So it's a cultural war between free people fighting a terrible, terrible uh, problem called democracy. America was never a democracy. It was a constitutional republic. So go back and do some homework on that, and you'll see why, uh, you know, why Trump is getting so much flack, because he's trying to reestablish America the way it was founded. So that's the name of that, too. Jordan Maxwell, thank you for this brilliant commentary, and see you next time for the sixth part of the interview. Okay, thank you very much again, Pierre. Good night. Bye.